Welcome back to the channel everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about why we crave sugar so much. It just seems like such a hard battle to get rid of all that amazing tasting junk food. Fries, sweets, candies and soft drinks. In fact, studies have shown that the addiction to sugar or the crave we experience can surpass the neural reward from even that of cocaine. This sounds incredible. So why do we crave sugar so much? To put it simply, there are factors that regulate feeding and appetite that's built into us. There is a part of our brain called the hypothalamus. Professor Andrew Huberman, a distinguished neurobiologist, talks extensively about the neural mechanisms of hunger in his detailed podcasts. His podcasts are amazing treasure troves of information, so do check them out if you have the time. Now, the hypothalamus has many interesting sites that do many things in our bodies. It is like a collection of control stations, all located on something less than the size of a pea. Among all the numerous control stations, we are going to look at two stations today. These two stations make the decision of if you should eat more or less, and in some cases, like anorexia, wanting to eat nothing at all. The two stations we are looking at are located in a smaller part within the hypothalamus called the arcuate nucleus. In the first station, we have a set of neurons called the PMOC neurons. By the way, neurons are just a collection of nerve cells. So these PMOC neurons make something called alpha MSH. Alpha MSH reduces your appetite or makes you want to eat less. The activity of MSH goes up after we finished our meal. In the same arcuate nucleus, right next to the PMOC neurons, we have another set of neurons called the AGRP neurons. And these neurons increases your appetite or makes you want to eat more. You know that excitement you get when you see or think of good food? That comes from this AGRP area. This is also what makes you hangry. Hungry, angry, hangry. When you haven't eaten for a while. This AGRP station is so powerful that if you were to surgically remove it, then people will just stop eating. You simply lose any desire to consume food, even if your body desperately requires it for nourishment. The appetite simply isn't there. In the opposite direction, if you were to somehow stimulate this area, people will eat out of control till they die. Yes, that can happen. Too much of anything can kill you, right? Besides these two stations in your brain, we have another hormone called ghrelin. Ghrelin comes from your gut and it works to increase your hunger. You must have surely noticed that feeling of wanting to bite into an amazing juicy burger, pizza or fried chicken precisely during lunchtime, on the dot. Your mouth starts to water up at the thought of food or your stomach starts to growl around the time of that day when you normally eat. All that is your hormone ghrelin working its magic. It is like a hormonal food clock in your body. Ghrelin also works when your glucose or blood sugar levels are low and it sends a signal to the control centers we talked about earlier in the brain telling it to make you want to eat. So you see how beautifully connected all these pathways are in creating something so simple that we call hunger. There is a huge complex intricate relationship with your gut and your brain. It is like an information superhighway telling your body to do what it does without you paying any attention to it. And there are several such pathways in our body doing multiple things each minute. By the way, if you are finding finding all this information useful, please do like and subscribe to my channel because I have a lot of information prepared just for you and I would really appreciate your support. So after talking about the internal mechanisms that make us want to eat, let's look at sugar itself. Sugar, it turns out, is all around us. And this might be an understatement as a lot of people don't realize how bad the situation might be. Besides a granular sugar that you add to your favorite drinks and meals, sugar is the main component in all your bread pasta, crackers, chocolate, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, pastries, and muffins. It's hard to go anywhere without running into sugar. But it does not end there. Even when you're trying to be conscious of your intake, you simply can't avoid it. This includes supposedly healthy options like bran, cornflakes, oats, low-fat yogurt, fruit juices, granola bars, protein bars, baked beans, and even pre-made soups. Since sugar is practically in everything we eat, it only increases our likelihood of developing insulin resistance. We will get into more detail about surprising foods that contain high amounts of sugar and even more toxic sugar substitutes in another video. But for now, let's say that even when you try to control your sugar consumption, it isn't possible to eradicate it altogether. If by some miracle you manage to find foods that allow you to completely switch from sugary foods, you'd still gravitate back. Why? If you're thinking the reason is taste, you're actually wrong. In a study that was published on Nature magazine conducted on mice genetically engineered with human taste receptors, the mice were given two bottles to drink from, water and sugar water. In the initial experiments, the mice went for the sugar water. Later, when their receptors for sweetness were removed, the mice didn't care which bottle they drank from since they couldn't taste the difference. But 48 hours later, something extraordinary happened. The mouse starts drinking only from the bottle that had sugar water. But how can this happen when the mouse does not have any way to detect sweetness? 
That's when the researchers realized that it has nothing to do with taste. Over the 48 hours, the mouse realized that there was something in the sweet bottle that made it feel good. It may not be able to taste the difference, but the sugar's effect on the body is the same regardless. This is what happens to all of us without any conscious thought. Our bodies detect something that makes us feel good, which is present in the sugar, and this is directly related to the gut-brain highway of hormones we talked about earlier. If the gut-brain highway has a sugar preference, there must be a set of neurons responding to the sugar in the bloodstream. So it doesn't matter if your tongue tastes the sweetness when you ate a piece of cake or have a sugary drink, it activates a response and selects select a group of cells in your gut that send your brain a message, I got what I wanted. This message gets stronger with the activity of consuming more of the same food because it is a good source of energy. This is also why artificial sweeteners won't work. Your gut can't recognize an artificial sweetener because it doesn't carry the same energy or nutritional value. So your gut-brain communication system isn't activated and therefore your desire for sugar isn't satisfied. So it seems like the cards are stacked against us. Cutting out sugar, removing receptors, and tricking our brain with artificial sugar won't work. So we continue to consume fatty foods, excess carbs, and sugars that all lead us to insulin resistance, which leads to diabetes and eventually metabolic syndrome. This confirms what you may have already experienced. Your sugar cravings are dictated by chemicals being released at precise moments in a day built on inbuilt automatic systems. If you can control when they are released, you can control your intake and portions. But maybe that's easier said than done. Regardless, the great thing about all this is that by knowing how the system works, you can control it. Yes. In the next video, I'm going to talk about a few components in food that can help us with our cravings and how we can play with our inbuilt systems to make it work the way we want. So stay tuned and take care. I'll see you around.